All right, guys, we're back. And what are we going to talk about today? Leopard geckos. And specifically, the hot button topic of the last couple of weeks is not only can, but should we be keeping leopard geckos together? Reptiles and Research is a great YouTube channel that I followed for a while now. You can see their link right here, Reptiles and Research. So I would definitely give them a follow if you're looking for a little bit more like scientific and pet centered ideology and propositions to be put forward. You know, I'm a breeder. I tend to come from a breeder perspective. But I love leopard geckos and I love seeing them go to pet homes. And so I'm always interested to see the best that is possible for them to live in. Also, they're just really cool little dinosaur critters. So let's take a look at what Liam has to say. Can leopard geckos live together and are they even social? Well, we're going to dive into that topic right now. So let's go. The most famous text is published on leopard geckos living in colonies. So we're going to start here. This article was posted in 2009 by Dr. Mohammed Sharif Khan, who has both a master's and a PhD in herpetology. So notice this dude is from Pakistan. One of the locations that leopard geckos are from. He has over 251 publications, 1,579 citations. I'd say that's pretty qualifying. And he's now the director of a herpetology lab, and he's still publishing work on the herpetofauna of Pakistan. So there we go. His credentials are very much established. His paper describes them as being gregarious, aka social, and that they colonize crevices and holes. Several lizards may live in loose colonies in holes in the ground, under stones, and crevices among rocks. A leopard gecko may climb several feet to reach its permanent selected resting place, which it shares with several individuals of different ages. So we know they use- All right, so there's a lot here to break down that I think we can actually observe in captivity. Number one, I always tell people, if you give your leopard gecko the opportunity to climb, it absolutely will. It'll climb five feet into the air if you give it the opportunity to with sticks and whatnot. So that is basically what he said right here. They live in, I actually don't know what the word gregarious means. So maybe one of you guys could comment below. But um, obviously they live in colonies in the wild is what he's saying. And this episode is going to reveal it's not just a colony they live in, but it's a hierarchy that they submit to. And that's very important because when we put leopard geckos together in captivity, we do see fighting. And maybe that's because they are not willing to submit to the hierarchy in that colony, but they might be willing to submit to the hierarchy in another colony. This is very, very similar with tegus. I have lots of friends that do tegus that have been doing tegus for a long time. And they've all told me you could keep tegus together. So what did I do last year? when I was short a couple cages, you know, because tegus are big, they take up a lot of space. We had a lot of babies and everything. I kept my five sub-adult males together that were all around three to four feet, just breaching adulthood. And what happened? One of the males became aggressively dominant to the other ones and was picking on them. And one male started to become malnourished and just, he didn't seem too happy. So I removed the aggressive male and then guess what happened? The male that was getting picked on was actually the second biggest male in that group. So when I removed the biggest male, he now became the dominator and he was dominating the other three, giving them a hard time. So I removed him and now both of those live on their own and the three that remained get along just fine and they're still together today just fine and this goes the same with females except females are less territorial than males i even have the sweetest boy in the world he if you saw one of my recent videos we brought him to a recent kids event and we had kids holding him we had adults holding him and when i put him with another male even he gets aggravated a little bit so i think you do have to understand that when you colonize animals that live in a hierarchy like tegus do and leopard geckos do you have to understand that not every animal is going to be willing to submit to that hierarchy and you have to be willing to either house them individually or find hierarchies and colonies that get along those at the site come out as the sun sets and are scattered to forage individually around returning to the site one by one just before dawn <laughs> okay so we used to call leopard geckos nocturnal then we called them crepuscular then we called them, I forget, there was another word for opportunistic. And then now we're returning back to nocturnal. Almost all geckos at the site came out as soon as sun sets. So in the evening, they're coming out and they scattered and foraged around 
individually and then return to the site one by one before dawn. Nocturnal. So we're back to nocturnal, which I'm cool with because I always tell people if you want to see your leopard gecko eating and moving around, get one of those little red lights and put it on for a couple hours from like 7 p.m. to like 10 p.m. Just keep that on and shut all the other lights off and you'll see your gecko foraging and hunting just like this. Now, I find this description particularly interesting. When they're dispersed to hunt at night, why don't individual geckos find their own microclimates to hide in, their own hiding places, away from conspecifics that they might find stressful? Why do they choose to travel back to be together? The composition of an eubleferian colony differs throughout the activity period of the gecko. A pre-breeding colony mostly consists of several subadults and adults. Soon fights among males ensue and scatter them, leaving a dominant male with several females constituting a breeding colony. Now this description seems to align with what we actually see in captivity. Males do in fact display agonistic territorial behavior towards- 100%. We had an accident, an incident one time here where one of our rack systems that doesn't have a backing to it, the person who was cleaning at that time didn't realize there was, wasn't a backing and pushed all of the male tubs further back so that it was exposed in the back and then discovered a bunch of males fighting. And thankfully, she sacrificed her own well-being and went in there and like with her hands separated the males. But they were definitely latching onto each other, very aggressive towards each other. I've heard certain instances where certain males will live together and not be so aggressive towards each other. But I would say that that is not the norm. I would say the norm is high aggression male to male other males with either a subordinate male leaving the area or a fight ensuing to establish dominance a breeding colony of a single male and a group of females oh, is often what her. many would do in captivity during the demolition of an old stone wall that was colonized by leopard gecko i chanced to observe and trace the extent of retreat chambers between stones inside the wall several openings lead by narrow vertical and horizontal passages leading into expanded chambers running across the 1.5 all right, so here he's basically saying how they opened up a chamber where there was massive amounts of tunnels and different layers that the leopard geckos were living and breeding and defecating in. And towards the very end here, he actually says that the animals, just like we see in captivity, they would all choose to defecate in one spot. Very interesting. My feet thickness of the wall. The leopard lizards stay clinging to the walls or sleep at the stony base. A special pocket at the base is reserved as a defecation site into which their feces fail to collect. An egg laying site may be used year after year by the same female or by several females in the colony. It's in a secure resting place regularly used by the geckos. A series of chambers within the brick wall used by the colony is actually mapped out here. The mention of geckos using a communal latrine in the wild also lines up with what happens in captivity. All right, this is a pretty cool portrait here. So let's take a look. It's not in English but you could kind of see all the different chambers and how far down these chambers went. The mention of geckos using a communal latrine in the wild also lines up with what happens in captivity. The use of a shared latrine actually suggests a certain level of social intelligence. I'm guessing latrine is like a British word or something for laboratory or like bathroom. But on that note real quick, if you didn't know this, leopard geckos will often poop in one area of their enclosure. And if you want them to poop in one specific area and they're scattering their poo, just take their poo, plop it into the area that you want them to poo and leave it there for a week or two. Once they catch on that that is their latrine, I could be using that word completely wrong, but that's their bathroom spot, then you can remove all of the poo and they will continually go in that spot. And that's basically what this study showed. And we've kind of known that by observing leopard geckos in captivity. So that's pretty cool. But also a shared understanding to only defecate in that chamber. Using the sense of other geckos to see where to defecate is a social behavior that would not have evolved if there was not some sort of evolutionary advantage to that behavior. Perhaps it mitigates the effects of pathogens and disease by keeping it all in one place. But totally agree with that. If, if all your poop is in one area, and it's not scattered around the rest of the den, that would definitely make the rest of the den more virus and bacteria free. However, every time you walked into that latrine or into that den to poop, 
you would be gathering all of the feces on you. Now, leopard gecko poo is very small, dries very quickly. And if it's pooed in dirt, it basically like turns to dust within a couple of weeks. So with isopods and worms and all kinds of other decomposition critters in the soil, it probably wouldn't be that bad. But why would they ever need to evolve this if they only ever lived near each other for short periods of time? This kind of waste management, if you will, suggests that they would actually live near each other for an extended period of time. It's notable that he actually describes females will share egg laying sites. I have actually seen females so his point that he's going into right now is they would not develop the social behavior of going to the bathroom in one location if it was only temporary. So he's using that as a sort of evidence that leopard geckos actually permanently like to stay together or permanently cohab themselves together in the wild into these groups. Females in stores that I used to work in share a lay box really amicably. In fact, that there's a is... <laughs> <laughs> that is something, isn't it? But yeah, I mean, leopard geckos, this is exactly what you see with tegus too. Tegus will have 20 feet of places to hide and get away from each other, but you find them always sitting right on top of each other. Way too many geckos in that tank, in my opinion, but it wasn't my circus, wasn't my monkeys. Often I would open up a lay box and find many- I'm gonna use that. Wasn't my circus, wasn't my monkeys. <laughs> Basically a nice way of saying, I didn't own the operation, so I just went along with what was happening. Females are resting inside. I have to remove the females to get to the eggs, and there would be a lot of eggs at the bottom of this moss in this lay box. An egg-laying box would be the most valuable resource in the world at that moment in time for a gravid gecko. So why didn't a female dominate that egg box and defend it from other females to guard that really valuable resource, both in the wild and in captivity. So why don't they actually destroy the eggs of the female that laid in there previously? Surely eat- So the point that he's making right now is if leopard geckos were territorial and if they found a good nesting box, the females would 100% protect that nesting box in the same way that an alligator, crocodile, monitor lizard does. Probably even snakes, you know, snakes that burrow and den individually. Retics do this. There's a famous retic video out there of a monitor lizard going after a retic in a cave that's protecting its eggs. So if leopard geckos did not want to live together and they were 100% territorial, why would they all nest together? And if there was a hierarchy, which he's about to get into, there is an established hierarchy, why would not the dominant female kick out the submissive females so that she could have the cream of the crop, the best place to lay? Eating a competitor's eggs would replace the vital nutrients that that gecko is going to use in producing her own eggs. We that, that's a good point as well. Eggs are full of calcium, D3, everything that leopard geckos need to fuel themselves for their own egg production. Why would they not eat each other's eggs unless... They were working together for the betterment of the species. And that's what he's about to go into. We know that other solitary species do so. When leopard geckos shed, they'll eat the shed. So they'll eat this low nutrition shed to not waste nutrition, but they won't eat a competitor's highly nutritious egg. Or even if they attacked another female and got her to drop her tail, then you've got that leopard gecko's fat reserve as a nice healthy treat to replenish everything that you've lost in producing your eggs. That's a good point. I don't know if you've ever, you know, like cohab like babies together and stuff, which is why I stopped doing babies in groups. I will only ever do two babies to a group right now because when you keep babies in groups of four or more, they start to nip at each other and then one will drop their tail and the other one will eat it. But that's basically what he's saying about females. If they were territorial and if they were isolatory individual geckos, they would kick you out of their den, eat your eggs, and they would scare you so that you would drop your tail and they would eat your tail for resources because the tail is full of fat, nutrients, proteins, resources, all that stuff that egg laying dominant females would need. It quite literally does not make sense unless you actually consider social behavior. I you agree, take Lehman, every opportunity I agree. to put yourself ahead as a gravid lizard. Every advantage you can take, you take it. Unless the evolutionary advantage 
is to not do that. Next, I'd like to show you a paper on spatial orientation of leopard geckos in a maze task. Now, this study actually found that le Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Check this out. Leopard geckos were able to navigate these maze tasks even when markers that are cues to navigate are removed. They actually found- Like a rat, leopard geckos were able to navigate through mazes and find the locations and the scientific signals that the scientists were testing for. Now he doesn't go into extreme detail about this paper, so maybe I will read this paper and then do a follow-up video just on this because this sounds really cool, but he does say a little bit more about it. Um, the individual geckos were employing different tactics to remember the maze and flexibly adjusted their strategies when different landmarks were removed. So we do know that left- They removed landmarks and the leopard geckos were still able to navigate the maze. So for anyone who's saying that reptiles or leopard geckos are like a low-brained species, this is kind of evidence against that. Now, it doesn't mean that we should anthropomorphize them and say that a leopard gecko thinks like a human thinks. A human wants a mansion, a leopard gecko wants a mansion. A human wants daily food and daily water. A leopard gecko wants daily food and daily water. We shouldn't think in those specific terms because they still are a different species at the end of the day, which is driven by a different biological code, biological priorities. So we do have to respect and recognize them as that. Leopard geckos can take in information about their surroundings and are likely able to space. You see how the leopard gecko just licked right there? I've always been saying that the tongue is like a sixth sense for the leopard gecko. So whenever we're doing shows or events with people, I always show people how the leopard gecko licks like every 10 to 15 seconds. And it's, I call it a sixth sense. I just say that this is, you know, how they sense what's going on in their environment, different textures, smells maybe even, which is what causes, I think, a little bit of trouble when you keep leopard geckos on pure, loose sand. Because they're always licking, they will always be licking up that sand. Actually map an environment in the wild. So if they have the I like that word, mapping. Their tongue is like mapping everything, right? Cognition able to do this when they disperse to hunt in the wild and they can map out the environment. Why don't they find an alternative site to go to rather than return back to the same one in the same colony? Especially if leopard geckos were solitary and conspecifics were stressful. How likely is it that that rock wall was the only microclimate, the only human microclimate on that whole hillside? Haven't we always heard that in the reptile hobby? Leopard geckos are solitary. Leopard geckos are solitary. They prefer to be by themselves. Well, this video and the research that this video is bringing to light is about to open your minds to a whole new possibility of how we should be potentially keeping our leopard geckos for enrichment so that they can operate with their full intent and design that they have evolved with and were created with and allow them to socialize. On the whole grassland or any other habitat you want to describe that's within their range. How likely is it that's the only option to them? Yet, they seemingly navigate their way back to familiar geckos that they know. Just to build upon familiar conspecifics, yet they- <laughs> I love this water bowl right here. So, this happens in my taggy water bowl sometimes, like a little bit of algae will grow on there and stuff, and that's usually never a big deal. But when people ask me like, does bacteria and mold grow in my gecko's water bowl? This is kind of what you want to watch out for. And what I always tell people is just take it over to the sink, rub it with your thumb or a sponge or a little bit of Dawn dish soap to get kind of that slimy feeling out. Now that slimy feeling is not the end of the world. It's not going to kill your gecko. It's probably not even going to be bad for your gecko in any sense or way, as long as you're changing out that water. And maybe Liam will have something to comment on that on a future video. But uh, a lot of people freak out about, you know, the water dishes for animals. How frequently do they need to be changed? If there's colors growing in your water dish, like, you know, bacteria colors and stuff, is that a concern? So that, that would be a good video to do in the future. But just know that reptiles are very hardy against bacteria, viruses, illnesses. And also our tap water has like chlorine and minerals and chemicals in it. I shouldn't say chemicals, but like minerals and chlorine that takes away 
bacteria, viruses, those kinds of things as much as possible. So as long as you're changing out that water, it's going to be touching that algae and kind of like purifying it and stuff, even if you don't scrape it every every color of algae away, you know? A study found that a male leopard gecko can differentiate between two familiar females. Male courtship behavior would... Okay, that is really, really cool. And it explains why when we put leopard geckos in groups, like I used to do one male for four females and the male would breed every single girl. And I was always amazed, like how does he not double breed a girl? And, and waste his energy. Although I do believe keeping them in large groups like that from a breeder efficiency perspective, I don't think that that's best because I do think if you want to save the energy of your male and breed him to other females and other groups that year, you might want to just do groups of two females, which is basically what we do right now. But what Liam's about to get into is so, so monumental. And it was really cool when I heard him say this a drop in frequency and latency with a familiar female but would ramp up and get excited with a new novel female now you can so did you hear that a male will get more excited for the pheromones and the smells of a girl that has not been mated with compared to a girl that has been mated with now we do know for because there's a lot of breeders out there that will put a male with one female overnight and sometimes they'll come back in the morning and, and they'll see that there was a bunch of fighting. And what that is, is the male mated with the female or the female didn't want to breed and then the female kept fighting him off all night long because he kept trying to rebreed or breed for the first time with that female. And so that's what I mean by efficiency of saving your male's energy. A male will try to double breed a female, 100%. And we actually repair our females about three to four times a season on average. If they lay infertile eggs, repair. If they're laying good eggs, repair after every two sets of good eggs. So that's about, you know, on average, you're looking at like four times a season or something like that, right? It might might be a little more, might be a little less. I don't always do it after like two pairs. Sometimes I do it after three clutches, I'll repair. If it's getting halfway through the season, I'll definitely repair. And if it's getting towards the end of the season, I might repair especially if that girl has laid infertile eggs. So there is a lot of repairing. I would say on average, each of our girls in our operation get repaired three or four times per season. And the male rebreeds them even though he's bred them earlier in the season and even though their pheromones say that they've been impregnated before, he still goes after them. Imagine this would be advantageous in stopping him from mating the same female over and over again and work his way around new females. This could be because they have to work their way around the colony and mate with all the females to maximize reproductive success. Recognition of individual females could be an evolutionary advantageous trait due to the high frequency of That's very interactions with females in close proximity. Or it could suggest a preference of finding new females to mate with. But then you would think that would mean more roaming from a dominant male. Or perhaps it actually urges on the males that have been banished from colonies to mate with females they come across when these females leave the colony colonies on their dispersals out into the environment to hunt. Yeah, you would think then that a male, if he's fertilized every female in a den, like let's say there's six females in a den, he breeds and fertilizes all of them. Why would he then not move to another den? It's a good question. Maybe they're family oriented, social, you know? In other solitary species, they may not even need to discriminate between more than sex, let alone familiar females in this way. Or it could just be a trait that developed in a common ancestor and actually has no relevance to sociality or colony life whatsoever. Another study on leopard gecko reproduction found that females that mated with more than one male had more clutches, had increased egg fertility and larger eggs than fe All right, so that's pretty interesting. Females that mated with more than one type of male, like different males, d had much better fertility. Females that mated with one male. And then with females that mated with one male, but multiple times, fell somewhere in between those two. That's what we do in captivity. We basically take the same male and breed him to the same females more than one time a season. Well, logically, it makes sense. It would be advantageous that reproductive success is higher when outbreeding occurs. Those females that disperse from colonies may mate with males that do not have a group of their own females. This 
So outcrossing is less inbreeding and therefore advantageous to natural selection and evolution of the species. Um, yeah, I could see that. As far as why females would be more gravid with two males, but I could also see it that maybe the sperm in one of the males was weaker. You, you know, um, so there would definitely need to be more more research on that. It could just be that one male sperm was superior to the other males, or when the female took in the sperm, it was just random luck for the ones that they observed that they seemed to be more fertile. Now he's about to get into the point that. A female with more sperm in her body for the breeding season stands a way higher chance than the female with less sperm. And so he's kind of going to conclude with that. This would actually add genetic diversity to a colony and add genetics to a group that would otherwise probably suffer from inbreeding. It reminds me of the cuttlefish scenario where you have a dominant male that will protect females, but then you have a subordinate male that actually present himself as female and sneak in and mate with the females. Now that actually <laughs> adds genetic diversity to the actual pool of cuttlefish, but they still have dominant males, but then subordinate males will still mate with females. Yeah, that happens with some animals. Uh, I've seen that on the Discovery Channel. A non-dominant male will pretend like he's a female. He'll give off the vibes of a female so that he can sneak into the den and mate with the females. Man, that is, uh, that's some home wrecker stuff right there. That is, well, what, what I mean to say is that is, that shows the true passion of this species to repopulate is that, they're willing to put their life on the line. A dominant male could certainly do real harm to a subservient male. So the subservient male is taking a huge risk at going into the den and breeding with the dominant male's females. It's A and B, not A or B. However, this is only speculation on my part because we don't really know enough. Additionally, more sperm received by a female in multiple matings just means more sperm to use. Yep, this definitely. explains why multiple pairings with the same male is better than one pairing. Look at that face. I love my leopard gecko's faces. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I always tell people this when breeding, they're like, how many times should I pair and stuff like that? I say, look, you only need to do it once, but it would be beneficial if you can get more locks on that girl, either up front in the beginning of the season or throughout the season. Of that single male. I don't really think this is evidence for or against social groupings, but rather it signifies that we don't know enough about gecko dispersals and social networks in the wild. Another study found that leopard geckos would look to where another gecko was looking to see what that gecko was looking at. This is really cool. And, and maybe this is why leopard geckos are so observant in captivity. We we all know this, right? Everyone who has a leopard gecko knows that when you keep a leopard gecko for long enough, as soon as you walk in the room, it pops its head up and begins looking at you. Sometimes even walking out of its cave and walking up to the glass. And we think that the leopard gecko is greeting us, which in a way it's looking for food. It knows that you bring food and stuff, but it could be this biological programming inside of the gecko to want socialization and to see what you are up to. And that's what Liam's about to get into. He said that there was a study showing that leopard geckos that looked at a certain target, other leopard geckos would look at that target. This is so similar to human beings, right? You yawn, somebody else, is, somebody else yawns. You look at something, somebody else is going to look. It's a social interaction of, hey, we're in this together, right? You look and you see a dragon in the sky and somebody else looks and they see the same dragon. Then you look at each other and there's a communication between the two of you guys that, hey, look, there's a dragon in the sky. We got to go into the house. <laughs> Now this is called gaze following. Gaze following is advantageous in species where individuals regularly interact. It also indicates a higher level of social intelligence. They're smart There's boy. Only really They're smart. Boy, he thick. Boy. It's been heavily studied in things like mammals and birds. Gaze following in a social species can reveal utilizable knowledge about gecko. another individual's future intentions. Being sensitive to another animal's gaze can actually help with foraging or help them detect predators far earlier than they would on their own. Again, many species have been shown to do gaze following because of the many frequent interactions with members of their own social species. However, there is the argument that gaze following is likely basal and it actually evolved in 
ancient amnio ancestors and is present in many species, solitary or social. So following on from leopard geckos looking at each other, there was a study on UV reflectance in leopard geckos. They were looking to see whether UV mm. reflectance was used as a means of complex visual communication among leopard geckos. They found that the geckos had high UV reflectance of areas of low pigmentation or high whites. And this could have evolved as a complex anti-predatory mechanism or evolved as a social communication mechanism to other geckos, whether that be mate choice or simple recognition of individuals. So basically, if I understand that correctly, the geckos that have higher white would be seen and recognized more often by the geckos that don't have higher white. Or recognition of individuals. They would definitely see a blizzard then. <laughs> individuals. Could there be more to UV reflectance in social communication in leopard geckos? We do know that the tail is heavily used to communicate between leopard geckos, whether that be slow tail wags or vibrant tail rattles from males. Yeah, usually the vibrant tail rattles are for breeding and then the slow wavy tails are for warning. And those are basically the two movements I've seen besides obviously a tail coming off and moving on its own. So it does seem logical that UV reflectance on the tail would be a contextual part of that communication. But how does the wild translate to captivity? Do people keep these leopard geckos together? Yeah, this is actually a great point. Just because they're kept a certain way in the wild, does that mean that we should keep them this way in captivity? Take dogs, for example. We certainly do not keep dogs in captivity like they are in the wild. Certainly not. They've been domesticated for our purposes, for our benefit. And now, if you were to throw a chihuahua or a Pomeranian out into the woods, it would most likely not survive. It doesn't have the fundamental resources and knowledge and instincts to survive. The argument could be made that we need to do what's best based on the way that we keep animals in captivity and the inclinations and instincts that have been bred into these leopard geckos for the last 40 years in captivity. For example, leopard geckos rarely ever drop their tails, but in the wild, almost 100% of leopard geckos will drop their tails, and I'll show it to you here in a small, quick clip. So question is, should we just do what's best for them based on how we've been domesticating them in captivity? Or should we give them the opportunity to reconnect with their wild, social, instinctual biology? Well, yes. Many breeders for decades have kept leopard gecko females together and have rotated in males between groups. It's also very common in reptile stores here in the UK to house leopard geckos together. I mean, I've worked in ones that do just that. And many hobbyists also cohabitate leopard geckos. The British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums, aka Biaza, has recommendations for its members on how to cohabitate leopard geckos. And their guidance says that large enclosures can house female leopard geckos together but with their okay so he can't share the document but the organization that he was just referring to the zoological organization that he's talking about said that you can house in a large enclosure multiple females but only with one male it doesn't say whether it needs to have a male but you should only have one male present and it should be a large enough enclosure. As males are aggressively territorial. If subordinates are bullied, they may need to be housed separately. And this guidance actually seems proportional to the groupings found in the wild by Dr. Khan in Pakistan. However, there are many leopard gecko keepers that actually oppose keeping them together and expect cohabitation <laughs> to result in injuries or even death and believe zero risk is essential by keeping a leopard gecko solitary. So let's examine some arguments for and against you so he said a key word right there risk anytime we do anything in the reptile hobby you just have to fa factor in risk and this is why i'm not so quick to judge others because certain risks that i take other people might not take and certain risks that i don't take other people might take and so i think we're all in this game together as far as we're all taking risks in this hobby to some degree and whether you're a breeder or a keeper, there's different levels of risks that you give into. But I always like to say that keepers need breeders and breeders need keepers. Breeders need people to buy their animals and keepers need people to breed their animals. There's obviously price points attached to this, resources, space, time, money, efficiency. There's a lot of things that go into a breeding operation. And so that's why as a breeder, I find it super, super exciting 
when I get to release my geckos to keepers, somebody that's going to buy them a mansion and deck them out with all that this gecko can possibly have. I love seeing that. And if you go to our review section on our website, you could see so many different reviews of everybody that has so far left a picture or video reference of the gecko that they received from us. And I think it's so exciting to see all these leopard geckos in these natural vivariums and in people's homes as pets. But the pet keepers also have to understand it's not easy to to breed and house and sell and market these guys. And so breeders will often use rack systems to keep their geckos organized, well cleaned and prepared to quickly pull out and ship off. But I think if every breeder had their option, every breeder would do bioactive large cages for all of their geckos because that passion in our heart to see what's best and what's most enriching for our animals lives in there, which is why we work so hard to be able to move these animals and provide these animals for you so that you can provide that for them. So I think we both need each other, keepers and breeders. You could argue that since they're social in the wild, keeping them solitary in captivity means that they have a large part of their behavioral repertoire basically denied to them. And you could argue that. Yeah. Um, what would be an example of this? I guess an example of this would be just, just a quick thought that came to mind. Let's say a woman has a baby in prison and then that baby is raised in prison and never knows the outside you are denying that baby an enrichment and interaction with the outside world that it's never had that most people do have that aren't born in prison and so the question is with leper geckos should we reignite this part of their brain and interaction that we normally cut off from them in captivity by housing them together with other animals in a hierarchy, in a social setting where they get along, as long as the group is cooperating with each other and living peaceably together. That's the question. What is the difference between an animal that's pushed out of its social group and disperses out into the wild versus a keeper noticing that happen in their vivarium and separating that gecko? Now, a counter argument to that. Yeah, that's basically what we do is like in, in the groups that we've had, and I don't really have to do this anymore, but in the groups that I've had where there was a female getting picked on or something, I'll just remove the aggressive female or remove the female that was getting picked on or remove both. Uh, whatever is needed to make that group peaceable. So that's kind of what he's talking about here is in the wild, they would naturally kick out the female, but in captivity, we kick out the female, so to speak. We remove the females that are having an issue. That would be that leopard gecko activity peaks during the nocturnal hours. So it would be normally when a keeper is sleeping and therefore unable to intervene at the right moment should it happen when they're asleep. So you Yeah, a lot of people are like, my leopard gecko doesn't come out. And I'm like, turn on the light at night. <laughs> you'll see him come out. They will come out. And they usually come out like, from what I've seen with my leopard geckos is, and this is a captive setting, right? So this is very different than the wild, but they usually like to come out like seven through like midnight. So like 7 p.m. through midnight. So if you have a kid that's using, that has a leopard gecko in their room, I say sometimes you could use like the red bulb as a nightlight, you know, and then the bulb can cut off so that the gecko has like pure darkness for a certain time period throughout the night. And then you only need 10 to 12 hour heat cycles for your leopard gecko. So if you're going to do it that way, I would almost suggest just like kicks on at nine in the morning, kicks off at nine at night. And then if you look between eight and nine at night, you'll see the gecko moving around hunting, foraging, because it's kind of like waking up, right? That's like their morning and they're coming out. Or you could do 10 to 10 or you could do noon to 10 or noon to nine, like anywhere in that time zone is fine. I just like to encourage people, you know, 10 to 12 hours of access to heat. Sometimes that's not always needed because the leopard gecko is just sleeping for the first six hours of the day, right? So maybe just keep it on for six to eight hours. Like that's kind of up to you. But I usually like to encourage people around that 10 hour mark that the gecko has access to a warm spot and heat is great. You'd be putting them at more risk by putting them in an environment that they can't actually escape from. You could argue that colonies in the wild does not translate to vivariums because a vivarium is inherently an enclosed space. An enclosed space that actually a leopard gecko can be cornered in. But then yeah. again, a vivarium can be much larger than the holes and crevices within a brick wall that's only 1.5 feet deep. 
and that a small dead end chamber in one of these walls is more packed in and enclosed to be cornered in than of a varium. You could argue that even females have been recorded in captivity fighting and squabbling and injuring each other. So they can't truly be a social species. But then again, so are rabbits, rats, guinea pigs. But rabbits will gouge each other's eyes out and kill each other and rats will chew tails and even kill each other. In some European countries, it's against the law to keep a rat or a rabbit alone because it puts them in a low welfare state to be in solitary confinement. Dogs mm. can be dog aggressive and straight up murderous, but yet we know they're a social species. Being a social species does not mean the absolute absence of conflict. You could argue that in the wild, they do not need to compete for basking spots, food, hides, or even egg laying spots. And in vivariums, it's limited. And in captivity, a dominant gecko can monopolize these resources. However, you could argue that a big enough enclosure could offer multiple hides, multiple basking spots, enough food, and have more than enough to compensate. If you have more than one resource for every gecko, then it's impossible to monopolize it by sheer maths. If you had an egg laying site for every female and they still choose to pile in and be together, then isn't that a choice? Now I could go on forever, but the point I'm trying to make is that it's an incredibly gray area and complex and certainly isn't black and white as people want to make it out to be. But then why do some geckos fight and some do not? Well, some little things can be explained by people cohabbing two females that they think are female but are actually male and then they post on the internet their females fight or beginners having completely incorrect care that actually exasperates issues and acts as a catalyst for conflict. A great many examples are probably likely due to husbandry error and I think many people cover that already so I would like to dive into the nuanced areas here. There are so many papers on temperature based sex determination in leopard geckos with differing incubation temperatures producing females with different hormonal profiles. Females that were incubated warmer had elevated levels of testosterone compared to other females. So that's pretty interesting. And this kind of goes into the hot female category of, you know, the this theory that's been pushed around the hobby for a long time that not only if you incubate them above a certain temperature, the females will turn male. But what he's saying is there's been significant research done out there to show that females just incubated at warmer temperatures in general have higher levels of testosterone. And what he's about to say is that makes them more aggressive. And it also makes males view them as a male and not a female, which would explain why some people have difficulty with their hot females or their females incubated at warmer temperatures breeding. Now, I can't necessarily say I've ever really had this issue and I've incubated plenty of geckos on the warmer side that wound up turning female. Out of a thousand plus geckos in my collection and let's just say like I don't know, six, seven hundred. I don't know. Let's say like six. I sold a lot of my females. So let's just say like five, six hundred of them being female. I only have two that are aggressive and they were not incubated at high temperatures. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, th I think more research would need to be done before you could say something conclusively. But apparently there's been research done to show that they do have higher levels of testosterone and that the males can potentially view them as a competitor male in that way. Making them appear more masculine and less attractive to males, but more dominant to other females. Another paper actually removed the chemical cues that a male will use to identify a female conspecific. And what happened was the male couldn't figure out whether it was male or female and acted aggressively. So what if increased levels of testosterone in masculine females actually causes them to be attacked by males and causes them to initiate conflict with other females. Well, that's exactly what happened in another study where females were surgically implanted with testosterone. The females actually acted with male traits such as tail rattling and were attacked by the real males. We already know that keepers recommend using clutch mates and cavitation setups because they seem to be the most successful. <laughs> that's a pretty interesting study man i did not know people were studying leopard geckos this intricately but that's pretty pretty interesting they injected female leopard geckos with testosterone and then put them with males and saw that the males treated those females with more hyper aggression he's thick boy that's a thick boy now i would have to read that paper to see if the female was introduced to the male as a female with low testosterone and everything was fine. Maybe even the male breeds with her. 
And then like the next year they inject her with testosterone and we see if he reacts that way to her. I think for you to conclusively say something, you need a large data pool because so many different leopard geckos and you guys who keep leopard geckos know this. So many different leopard geckos just have different personalities. And that's the bottom line. It has nothing to do necessarily with temperature, testosterone, any of that. They just have different personalities. And so that's something to take into consideration as well. And I don't know how you isolate that metric unless you test the same geckos in different scenarios. And even if you test the same geckos in different scenarios, meaning one time without testosterone, one time with testosterone, who's to say that in the second scenario with testosterone, who's to say that the female just isn't angry about being full of testosterone and therefore giving off aggressive vibes to the male, or maybe she's just having a bad day that day. So you would have to test this data over multiple animals, multiple different ways, multiple times to be able to conclusively say that this is the causation of this. There could be a correlation there, meaning that there seems to be a, a relationship here between this, between testosterone and aggressive females, but you can't say that it's an actual cause or causation unless you rule out every other fact that you could think about that could possibly be at play. And there's a lot of facts that you could think about that could possibly be at play. So successful. Now, could a major part of that be because they're actually incubated at the same temperature? And that temperature might have been low enough that it doesn't increase testosterone in those females. Let's even go back to the UV reflectance. Most geckos are trichromatic, meaning their eyes have three cones with differing sensitivities in UVA, blues and greens. Each of these cones needs to be stimulated by light in natural proportions for them to even see white light. So unless a leopard gecko has UV, they won't be able to see each other's UV reflectance. Now, how does that play? So there was a research done too recently, and, and again, this is a self-documented research, but there was a skink breeder that uh, breeding skinks without UVB is very common, but there was a skink breeder that decided to give all of his female skinks UVB and noticed that their fertility was much higher, they had less infertility, and so he started doing that for his entire collection, and now he swears by it, and he only does UVB and no longer neglects them of UVB. So the same thing could go for any species, ball pythons, leopard geckos, what if we gave them UVB? Would they have more clutches, more successful clutches, more fertile clutches, more often clutches, more healthy clutches? Like even down to the embryo in the egg and the baby that's growing, would they come out bigger, stronger, healthier, faster, more fit for life? I think the answer would be yes, because I think UV is so, so crucial, not only even to humans, right? Why is Oregon the most depressive state and has the highest level of depression in America? Because it has the lowest UV exposure for people. And then Arizona, beautiful. You could step outside and get UV every single day. And it feels great. It feels fantastic. And so if we as mammals who don't even rely upon the sun that much for our heat, for our temperature, imagine how much a reptile could benefit from UVB. And in captivity right now, we're just restricting them from that because it's easier to not give that to them. But I always like to encourage people, use overhead heat. Use UVB if you can, because I just think it's better for the animals overall. Into how leopard geckos interpret each other. Reflectance was highest in areas of least pigment. So what about morphs? Do the morphs that reduce pigment and make really high white leopard geckos make them light up like a Christmas tree? Is that alarming to other leopard geckos? Or the reverse, the really dark ones that have very little UV reflectance, is that alarming? We don't know what this means. If a I haven't seen anything being alarming. You know, black knights live together and they do just fine. We've obviously bred snows to black knights. We've bred tangerines to black knights. So I personally, in captivity, this could this could affect it differently in the wild. Plus, we don't give our leopard geckos UVB in captivity. So like he's saying, they need UVB to even see these different spectrums. So maybe they just adjusted without UVB to not fear any gecko based on its morph or color. But I can tell you that I haven't noticed anything different between the Black Knight breeding groups, the Tangerine groups, the Snow groups, the Afghanicus groups, the Turkmenicus groups, the Fasciolatus groups, the White and Yellow groups, the Albino groups. I haven't noticed anything different about one group is more aggressive than another. They're all 
pretty much the same. And they've all interacted with different morphs of each other as well. And I don't have any, you know, hundreds, thousands of times over the last couple of years that I've been breeding in higher quantities. And so that's my observation right now is it doesn't seem to make a difference to them in captivity, but that is without UVB. Would it make a difference with UVB? Leopard gecko is raised in isolation. Does it struggle socially? Do they make other leopard geckos uncomfortable because they behave atypically? Or are they uncomfortable because they can't read normal behavior in other leopard geckos? But can cohabitation actually be beneficial? I would say yes. If they gain reassurance from other geckos, or if sleeping together helps with thigmotaxis or even thermoregulation, we know that in turtles they pile up on top of each other, not because they're competing for the sun, but because it actually helps both of them with thermoregulation. So I think the test that we would have to run here, because we know, without a shadow of a doubt, we know that there have been leopard geckos that live well into their 20s, and even some into their 30s. I think Ron Tremper, the godfather himself of leopard geckos, All right, come on, do had a recorded 35-year-old male leopard gecko. So don't quote me on that. Leave a comment below if you know what section of his book mentioned that. I believe that that was in one of his books. So what we would have to do is set up groups of geckos and maybe even from the same offspring, right? So let's say one dad, two moms that are related. So like they're sisters. And the dad is obviously unrelated, breeds to these sisters and gives you 20 to 30 babies. 15 of those babies raise individually and 15 of those babies raise in groups or something of the sort, right? And see how long and, and treat them the same. If, if it's going to be, if you're going to give them UV and you're going to give them no UV, whatever the case is, treat them all the same. The ones in the groups and the ones individually, raise them up, see which ones last the longest and which ones seem to have more social behavior, less anxiety, less stress, better at handling. Because when an animal is less stressed, it's going to be better at handling, which is why some big boa species and skink species, they just don't care about being handled. They'll just let you handle them because they're not stressed. So there, there can be many factors to what causes stress. But if the cohabitation versus individual thing is causing some stress or not causing some stress, that should reflect in a study like that. So that would be a pretty cool study. And uh, maybe I will do that the last 30 years of my life and dedicate that to studying cohabs versus individual leopard geckos and documenting and recording the behaviors and everything that we find from that research. We just don't know enough. If the geckos have many resources of equal value, then it can't be monopolized by one individual and they still seek each other out. Isn't that a choice? Then if that's a choice, they... Yeah, it's kind of like what I was saying about the tegus. They'll have plenty of space to get away from each other, but they'll still cohabitate together. So at this point, he's saying, isn't that a choice? If made, do you not think there's more to it than that? I would cohab leopard geckos, and I probably will in the future. I'd be very comfortable with a 1.2 or 1.3 in one of my big seven foots behind me. But do I think we should recommend it to beginners? No, I don't. Because it's an advanced concept that requires more money... I like the way he puts this. Cohabitation is an advanced concept, so it should not be recommended to new keepers. And I agree because as a breeder, I need to observe the group. Are the girls getting along? Is the boy getting along with the girls? You know, I need to constantly be on top of that stuff. So a new keeper already has enough on their mind. Like, what should I feed them? How often should I feed them? What temperature zone should they have? Those are beginner level things. But once you graduate past that, what was the phrase that he used? I don't. Because it's an advanced concept that requires... An advanced concept. It's an advanced concept that should be reserved mainly for people that have the understanding and capabilities to do what's best for the animals if they need to wind up having to separate the animals and definitely make sure you're not putting two males together so that you have to know how to properly, you know, tell male from female and all that kind of stuff obviously will go along with that. Buys more money, more space for spare enclosures if you need to separate. The money for vet bills if something does indeed go wrong. And also because yeah, vets it relies are on the keeper's ability to read the dynamics of that group and read the behaviors of those geckos. And if you have... Yeah, as reptile keepers, I mean, any animal keeper, we are really body language body language <laughs> and behavioral readers when i hand a seven foot snake off to a kid and the the snake 
is like a foot from the kid's face or our big four foot tag you is being held in the hands of a five year old child. I have to know the body language of my animal to make sure that if there's any flinch, any inkling of a doubt that this animal is going to react in a way that could harm the person I need to take that animal from the person right away. And so I'm constantly watching all of our animals from small to big animals for body language and just observing their behaviors and movements so that I can know what state of mind is this animal in at this moment. If you haven't earned your stripes and you aren't keyed into that, then you can make mistakes. We know that stenos or even scorpion geckos are social, but even scorpion geckos have been reported to injure each other. But I wonder if scorpion geckos by by that he means coleonyx geckos. Because we have coleonyx geckos out here in Arizona and they are social. They do tend to live well together. And I have found them out in the wild together, like in the wild, in a giant field, right? Like I have found them in groups or together. So just something to think about. But the number of injuries that are reported are small by comparison and beginners might not even know what these species are or even that they exist, or they're just more attractive to seasoned hobbyists. In an alternative universe where scorpion geckos and leopard gecko situations were flipped and scorpion geckos were available, widely available to beginners and they were the common species and leopard geckos were in fact this expensive gecko that's just entered the hobby. I would bet that the seasoned advanced keepers would keep the leopard geckos socially and we would all be like, yeah, leopard geckos are social, but don't keep scorpion geckos together. Together. Availability of a species equals more husbandry errors by default. The evidence points towards leopard geckos truly being a social species and I truly believe that. We just don't know enough about them to talk in absolutes. So don't denigrate or attack people who choose to cavitate and don't judge people who are really uncomfortable with it. Yeah, that's a perfect way of saying it. You know, we're going to have different perspectives, different views, different preferences in this hobby, but we shouldn't frown or look down upon each other based on the choices that everyone is decides to make, you know, which is why I always like to educate openly. When someone comes to me, I'll tell them, look, this is the way I do it. This is the way, this is why I do it. This is the, the knowledge that I have. But let me tell you some other ways that people do it. And you can put all this information together and you can come up with what is right for you and what makes you feel best at this moment of keeping in your keeping career. We just don't know enough to talk in hard lines here. Dogma is the enemy of progress. Pretty sure I know what dogma is, but I'm just going to look it up here real quick. A principle or set principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. So you can't go against it. So you want your mind to be open to the possibilities of what you don't know. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, have yourselves a geeky gecko. Great day. Peace.